15, 20 minutes after the briefing and transcript will be posted tomorrow. Also, we are sending you uh, news from other regions, so please uh, pay attention on what uh, comes from us. I'll give a floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold, and the number of affected countries has tripled. There are now more than 118,000 cases in 114 countries and 4,291 people have lost their lives. Thousands more are fighting for their lives in hospitals. In the days and weeks ahead, we expect to see the number of cases, the number of deaths, and the number of affected countries climb even higher. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock, and we're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Pandemic is not a word to use lightly or carelessly. It's a word that, if misused, can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. Describing the situation as a pandemic does not change WHO's assessment of the threat posed by the virus. It doesn't change what WHO is doing, and it doesn't change what countries should do. We have never been before seen a pandemic sparked by a coronavirus. This is the first pandemic caused by a coronavirus. And we have never before seen a pandemic that can be controlled at the same time. WHO has been in full response mode since we were notified of the first cases. And we have called every day for countries to take urgent and aggressive action. We have rung the alarm bell loud and clear. As I said on Monday, just looking at the number of cases and the number of countries affected does not tell the full story. Of the 118 cases reported globally in 114 countries, more than 90 percent of cases are in just four countries. And two of those, China and the Republic of Korea, have significantly declining epidemics. 81 countries have not reported any cases, and 57 countries have reported 10 cases or less. We cannot, this, we cannot say this loudly enough, or clearly enough, or often enough. All countries can still change the course of this pandemic. If countries detect, test, treat, isolate, trace, and mobilize their people in the response, those with a handful of cases can prevent those cases becoming clusters and those clusters becoming community transmission. Even those countries with community transmission or larger clusters can turn the tide on this virus. Several countries have demonstrated that this virus can be suppressed and controlled. The challenge 
for many countries who are now dealing with large clusters or community transmission is not whether they can do the same, it's whether they will. Some countries are struggling with a lack of capacity. Some countries are struggling with a lack of resources. Some countries are struggling with a lack of resolve. We're grateful for the measures being taken in Iran, Italy, and the Republic of Korea to slow the virus and control their epidemics. We know that these measures are taking a heavy toll on societies and economies, just as they did in China. All countries must strike a fine balance between protecting health, minimizing economic and social disruption, and respecting human rights. WHO's mandate is public health, but we're working with many partners across all actors to mitigate the social and economic consequences of this pandemic. This is not just a public health crisis. It's a crisis that will touch every sector. So every sector and every individual must be involved in the fight. I have said from the beginning that countries must take a whole of government, all of society approach, built around a comprehensive strategy to prevent infections, save lives, and minimize impact. Let me summarize it in four key areas. First, prepare and be ready. Second, detect protect and treat. Third, reduce transmission. And fourth, innovate and learn. I remind all countries that we're calling on you to activate and scale up your emergency response mechanisms. Communicate with your people about the risks and how they can protect themselves. This is everybody's business. Find, isolate, test, and treat every case and trace every contact. Ready your hospitals, protect and train your health workers, and let's all look out for each other because we need each other. There has been so much attention on one word, and you know that. Let me give you some other words that matter much more and that are much more actionable. These are prevention, preparedness, public health, political leadership, and most of all, people. We're in this together to do the right things with calm. We're in this together to do the right things with Cal and protect the citizens of the world. It's doable. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director General. Before we start with questions, I'll remind the uh, journalists uh, uh, joining us uh, through uh, dialing in. It's uh, star nine on your keypad. For those who are watching us on Zoom, <laughs> For those uh, who are joining us on Zoom, it's uh, clicking on raise hands. I will ask really uh, journalists to ask only one question uh, so we can get as many as possible. And we will start, as we always do here in the room, with a couple of questions. Uh, Musa, please, if you can come down and uh, use the mic, please. Um. À ce stade de, de la propagation de, euh, de ces virus dans certains pays, est-ce que vous recommandez euh, la fermeture de, de certaines institutions comme les écoles euh, ou bien la frontière, les aéroports Et quelle est la situation aujourd'hui en Iran Merci. So the question is, at this stage uh, of the epidemic, uh, what's your uh, recommendation when it comes to uh, closing institutions such as schools? Uh, and what about uh, closing uh, borders and airports? And finally, uh, what's the situation in Iran? 
Uh, the decision to close schools and, and, and to uh, do lockdowns or shut down particular parts of a country uh, are entirely based on a country's own risk assessment. And, and uh, it's a mix of measures. For example, in some situations, schools have been closed, like in China, whereas in Singapore, schools weren't closed. Uh, the governments make decisions based on a mixture of issues, the risk, the likely impact of the measure, the acceptability of the measure. Uh, the length of time the measure has to be left in place. Uh, certainly uh, reducing or increasing social distance can certainly slow down the spread of disease, but it is a poor substitute uh, in, in the countries with lower numbers of cases. Social distancing does not have the same immediate impact as contact tracing, isolation of contacts, isolation of cases, quarantine of contacts, because that means you're chasing the virus. When people move towards broader-based social distancing measures, it effectively accepts that the chains of transmission are no longer visible. So what you want to do is separate everybody because you don't know who's infected. It's a much more cost-effective measure at the beginning to identify those who were infected or potentially infected and isolate them from the community. When you lose track of the outbreak, then you have to social you have to create social distance between everybody because you don't know who's infected. It is a poor substitute for aggressive public health action at the beginning, but it may be the only option when you've effectively lost sight of the virus. Uh, so it really does depend on the stage of the epidemic and it sometimes depends on social acceptability. There is no point in reality in governments implementing measures that are entirely unacceptable within a local context because it can create more tension and more problems than it solves. So again, without overdoing it, we would not, other than offer countries advice on any specific situation, but we don't have a specific rule regarding uh, social distancing or school closures, etc. With regards to Iran, our team is still on the ground. We have uh, part of our international team has already left Iran, but a team will remain on the ground with the Iranian authorities. Clearly, the situation in Iran is still very serious. Uh, there's still a very high number of deaths. There's a high number of uh, sick people. And <clears throat> while the number of cases and the intensity of surveillance has increased, we would like to see that increase even, for, uh, even further. Uh, and we would like to see more support to the clinical care of sick people in Iran both within Iran, certainly, but with our support and the support of the rest of the international community. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Latino. Uh, we uh, informed you that there will be a press conference by our regional office tomorrow, uh, our regional office for Eastern Mediterranean. Now that, that press conference has been postponed for Monday. We will send the uh, details on that. We go for the next question here. Uh, Chen, please. Okay. So, uh, One question. One question, please. Um, what is the decision-making um, uh, mechanism within WHO concerning the uh, declaration of pandemic? So, and uh, are the member states involved in the procedure? Thank you. There is no. Uh uh, the DG has said this many times. There is no formal process, and, and, and pandemics as such are not declared. It's not like a public health emergency of international concern, in which there's a body of international law where WHO engages through the emergency committee, through the national focal points, in making that decision. This is a characterization or a description of a situation. And the DG has said it is not a change in what we do, it is not a, a, a trigger for anything other than more aggressive, more intensive action. So, and in that sense, uh, uh, it, it is not and would never be declared as such. The second uh, point is that it is taken very seriously because we understand the implication of the word and the Director General has gone through a very detailed set of internal and external consultation with experts, with his regional directors, with many of us over long hours uh, in in assessing uh, the use of the word as a as a as a characterization the likely uh, benefits potentially of galvanizing uh, the world to fight uh, but also 
the, as the DG has outlined, the dangers of using a word if people use it as an excuse to give up or if people see it as something that grows fear. So there's a lot of internal consideration has been given. The Director General has listened to people from across and throughout and very deep into our organisation. This has not been a corporate decision in the sense of made by only the seniors in this House. He has listened to everybody uh, and has come to a, a determination based on, on a broad-based input of expert advice, both internally and externally, in order to determine this. But there is no mathematical formula, there is no algorithm. Uh, this is a characterization of the current description of the outbreak uh, around the world, and a call to action, uh, and a call not to give up. But the DG may wish to comment himself on, on his, uh, his thought process. I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank can I, you. Can I, say, can I add what I think is more important here is how we have been working with all of our member states. We have been working across all of the countries, affected countries and not, about assessing the situation over time from day one. And we've been sitting up here telling you that, that there are many characteristics that are really important for us to better understand that relate to transmission. And how is this virus circulating? What is the extent of infection? Who is most at risk for infection? And with regards to severity, who is dying from this disease? How are people dying? And what can we do for, to prevent people from dying? And thirdly, the impact. And I think what we have been doing from day one is gathering evidence, learning from each other, learning from what China experienced, how they handled the situation, learning from what Korea is doing and Japan is doing and Singapore is doing, and we can go on and on and on. And every day we have these assessments. Every day we're looking at the evidence. Um, and, and that's what's really critical. Our guidance, our recommendations from very early on, our first guidance was published, I believe it was on the 10th of January. Um, and that is an assessment of based on what we were, we were seeing in the evidence and what we expected to happen. We are constantly revising that and that doesn't change and it hasn't changed what we've been recommending to all governments and all people. Thank you very much. Let's take one more question uh, from here. Let's start with a lady that we've seen for the first time here. If you can introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Neil Farquhar Brown from Iran International. I replaced by mm -hmm. my colleague. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, you said you're grateful about the measures Iran made uh, to counter the virus. Uh, would you please elaborate on that and tell us more about the team came back from Iran? What do you think is needed right now inside Iran? Because we're hearing that there has been lack of med medical supplies and equipment inside of Iran because of the sanctions. Yeah, yeah there are the the, um, the team and, and the DG spoke to this previously. What he particularly referred to was the fact that there was now an all-of-government approach. There was national leadership. There was buy-in and, and, and coordination between the national and the sub-national leadership, and there was a coherent strategy. And the fact that that strategy was launched as a as a single plan, and there's that people are gathering around that as a single strategy. Uh, surveillance has certainly been enhanced in terms of the case detection and the, the amount of testing. And in order to support that. In working in conjunction with the Chinese government, uh, China brought in over 20,000 tests. We brought in over 100,000 tests into Iran over nearly two weeks ago. The days blend into one another at this point. Um, and equally, uh, both uh, China and ourselves brought in personal protective equipment. We've made it clear that those supplies are in are very, very short, and we're struggling to find other supplies externally. We do, as I said previously, have thanked the uh, United Arab Emirates for their facilitation of the process. And again, we're working with, uh, with countries, including China, on reef resupplying our logistics hub in, in Dubai. Um, so um, uh, we've sent a further uh, 100,000, 40,000 tests into Iran over the last 24 hours again to increase the intensity of testing. Um, and in the end, you know, all of this is uh, drawing millions of dollars uh, of resources in order to continue to supply that. Uh, right now in Iran, there is a shortage of ventilators. There's a shortage of oxygen. Um, and clearly, and you've seen this in Italy and you've seen this in other countries, what happens at this stage in, in, in an epidemic that's intense, that's generating a lot of severe cases? Uh, as of this morning in Italy, there were nearly 900 people in intensive care. 
that requires a huge health worker commitment. Mm -hmm. To take care of intensive, really unwell people can often require two to three medical staff at one time, all in protective gear for hours and hours. Number one, they use up a lot of protective gear. Number two, they become exhausted very quickly. And our concern for our colleagues in Iran and in Italy right now is actually the caseload, the demand on the health workers, and the dangers that come with fatigue and potentially shortages of PPE. So we all must move quickly. While some countries are affected more than others, uh, and yes, we can get into the game of whether governments are doing enough or not enough, or whether things were better planned or should be planned. The fact is, right now, in countries, we have frontline health workers who need our help. We have hospitals who need our support. We have people who need our care, and we need to focus on getting our frontline health workers the equipment, supplies, and, and, and training they need to do a good job. So I think we need to, in that sense now, all focus on the job at hand. We can work out after the fact, uh, could we have done it better, or who's at fault, or who's to blame. We really need to focus on the word that the Director General has been using for weeks, solidarity, getting the job done. We need to move now. Iran and Italy are in the front line now. They're suffering, but I guarantee you other countries will be in that situation very soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we all need to show that solidarity for each other. We're focused on practical support to Iran. Uh, and, and, and we will continue to provide that and working with international partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Just two lines I would like to add. Um, uh, from the reports we got from our experts who are on the ground, uh, we know that Iran is doing its best, all it can. That's number one. And that's what I appreciated. And second, uh, they need lots of supplies. And as Mike said, we have tried to support as much as we can, but there is still a shortage. And we're trying to mobilize more support for, for Iran. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll try to take a few questions from uh, journalists online, and uh, uh, I will remind how you can ask a question. It's uh, star nine for those online and those dialing in and it's a clicking raising hand uh, so let's try let's start with uh, Helen Bransfeld. Helen can you hear us can you hear us I can thank you very much for taking my question I'm wondering if you are getting additional information from China in particular I'm interested in finding out if you had any word about the serology study that they were meant to be doing I would have thought that they would have had data by now Thanks, Helen, for that yes, question. Um, one of the things that we are we are hoping for uh, in the coming weeks are results from serologic surveys. So as you all know, um, molecular tests were developed very quickly, serologic assays are being developed very quickly, and they're in use in a number of countries. Um, we understand that there are sero surveys that have begun in several countries, including in China. Um, we do not yet have the results from those. But what we're hoping for, what the results we are expecting in the coming weeks will have to do with better understanding the extent of infection in the general population, um, hopefully by age structure. Uh, we've seen the protocol uh, that will be used there, and it is an age-stratified general population zero survey. So it will take some time. Um, we do need to give them the time to run these epi investigations, these zero epi investigations. Um, we are uh, pressuring them, and not only China, all countries to carry out these types of investigations, share their results with us so that we could better understand how transmission is occurring. But it will take, it will take some time. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let's try uh, Isabel from uh, FA. Spanish News Agency. Isabel, can you hear us? Hello, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Is regarding the rapid increase uh, of cases in Spain in the last uh, 48 hours, and I would like uh, to know if you consider that the measures imposed by the government are enough or it needs to be more aggressive at this stage to contain the spread of the virus? Um, I think uh, all countries now need to take a very close look at what are their objectives in responding uh, to the epidemic in their own country. Are they uh, accepting that the disease 
can now spread completely in an uncontrolled fashion to all corners of their country and they're going to focus on just trying to keep the health system moving forward and trying to keep the health system from collapsing. That's what's known as mitigation and the focus is on uh, effectively supporting the health system to reduce fatality. Uh, we've had uh, lots of people talking about containment versus mitigation. The Director General has spoken since the very beginning of this outbreak uh, about a comprehensive approach to this epidemic, focused on containment where there's an opportunity to contain, containment on isolating the virus within the chains of transmission that exist, uh, and preparing the health system to reduce the impact should the disease uh, escape that uh, control or escape that containment, and that is what's known as mitigation. Uh, it's very important that people, I think, understand that the DG statement today is not an escape clause to mitigation. It's not about saying, okay, the, now we have a description of pandemic, we all move to mitigation. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is not the time for countries uh, to move towards mitigation only, uh, unless and until they are not in a position to affect the course of the epidemic and try and stop this uh, organism. The difficulty is that if you do not try and suppress this uh, virus, it can overwhelm your health system. So you, there have to be very strong efforts made to suppress infection, to, inter to push the infection back, because at the very least, it will take the pressure, it will allow and flatten the curve and allow your health system to remain uh, in control um, and, and, um, and, and, and uh, achieve some success in, in reducing case fatality. So from that perspective, I think uh, it's very important that we use our words very carefully from here on in. With regard to Spain, um, Spain has a uh, number of cases has uh, have accelerated uh, very, very quickly over the last couple of days, as have France, as has Norway, as has Denmark, and has, as have a number of European countries. So it's very important that countries in the European Union and in Western Europe really do look at what their current control strategy is for this disease and to assess whether the efforts they're taking are good enough in terms of suppressing transmission uh, and, uh, and pushing back the virus and then obviously preparing their health systems to cope with the cases that do occur. All countries need to review their strategies right now. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would be happy to add uh, to that. Uh, I had a very good uh, discussion with His Excellency Pr Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez of Spain uh, two days ago, and I was, um, in, you know, very much impressed by his commitment. And Spain is using the whole of government and whole of uh, society approach, and uh, we believe that uh, that political leadership is really key. And we discussed about uh, that uh, approach mobilizing the whole society and uh, making the response uh, everybody's uh, responsibility. And uh, we hope to see um, progress in, in, Spain, in Spain too. Uh, the Prime Minister took uh, the initiative to, to call WHO and to, to consult. And that's a very uh, important measure, actually, indicator uh, of leadership, and he told me that he's prepared to do everything uh, to stop uh, this outbreak. Uh, then on containment and mitigation, again, uh, we don't want um, anyone to make a mistake. Uh, when we, um, um, uh, you know, say the situation now is pandemic, we are not saying uh, that the world should move from containment to mitigation. We are not. Uh, we believe, as WHO, uh, that the comprehensive or blended approach should continue. And in that comprehensive and blended approach, containment should be the major pillar. As Mike said, the numbers themselves actually speak why uh, we're saying this. 81 countries have no cases, so they should do everything to prevent from importing any case. They shouldn't give any ground for this virus to, to set foot in their country. And then there are 57 countries 
who have reported less than 10 cases, 10 or less cases, they can cut it from the bud. 81 plus 57 is 138 cases. And 90% of the total number of cases we have, the total 118 cases globally, four kind countries reported 90% of it. 90% of the 118,000. So it will be a mistake to abandon the containment strategy. Of course, the rest of the countries will be between the four countries who have re reported more than 90% and those who have reported 10 cases or less. So we believe that the best way forward is the blended comprehensive approach which puts containment as a major pillar. And we have also given examples. Many countries have already shown that when you have cases, still can be contained, however big the number of cases is. And we are convinced that although this is the first coronavirus to be labeled as pandemic proportion, but at the same time, we believe that it will be the first also to be able to be contained or controlled. That's what we are saying. It can be because we have seen progress in countries that have already shown this. So we repeat again, we are not suggesting to shift from containment to mitigation. We are not. We underline that. We are still proposing containment strategy and other strategies, a comprehensive and blended strategy. But consider, considering the geographic spread and the number of cases that has increased in the past two weeks, we should double down and we should be more aggressive. That's what we're saying. Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, now call on Christoph uh, from uh, Rwanda. Christoph, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. I hear you well. Uh, I have a couple, a couple of questions. Uh, the first, I want you to give us an overview of the status of from where? preparedness and Quarantine centers. What? Can you see? Can you hear, hear me? May I go? Uh, may I go ahead? May I go uh, ahead? Christophe, uh, Christoph, can you try one more time? Uh, you are broken, but please go ahead. We heard uh, that it's something about preparedness, but repeat your question, please. Okay. I want you to give us an overview of the status of preparedness and response in Africa in terms of surveillance, treatment centers, supportive treatments, availability in Africa. Uh, secondly, secondly uh, there is a, an unverified, an unverified verified information that black people are resistant distant to COVID-19. Uh, and, and this is affecting people's willingness to implement preventive measures. What's your comment on this? Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Um, uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we've been, I think uh, actually uh, Africa in general has made uh, very rapid progress in its uh, general levels of preparedness over the last uh, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, all countries in Africa now have the capacity to make the diagnosis, and some are demonstrating that, uh, unfortunately, through the diagnosis of COVID-19 cases. Uh, a lot of syndromic surveillance systems, early warning systems, polio systems in Africa are now been turned towards detecting ARI. The network of two reference labs for 
influenza surveillance and the network of labs for national influenza labs have been working together on detecting, um, uh, doing systematic testing in samples collected with suspected flu, and they're now testing those samples systematically for COVID-19 across a number of countries in Afro. 41 of 47 countries in the Afro region, the Afro region is essentially sub-Saharan Africa in, in Africa for WHO, have completed... Yeah, we oh. 